some of the Jewish scholars, some of the rabbis, they try to mitigate this physical form of God, changing mind, not knowing these kind of stuff, to give it in such a fashion that they started putting some kind of intermediaries between God and us, the human being. That whenever God comes, it is not him, it's his major angel. One of the angels who is not like God, but who is what? Very close to having the power of God. Some of them, they said, no, it is his presence, Hadra. Hadrat al Rab, you know, this is the presence of God, which is basically Shakhina, but they call it what? Sakina, Shakhina. So now what happens is that by the first or second century before Jesus, peace be upon him, the word Shakhina or Sakina became like a person. So they will have the meeting in the synagogue, close your eyes, God is coming down. It is just like what? The Sakhina. It's not God himself. It is the Sakhina of God. So Sakhina of God put the chair and I will just for the sake of giving you example. I mean sometimes these examples are not appropriate. Even in some of the popular, you know, belief systems, and I don't want, don't want to mention, some people believe the same thing about Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa That he is coming, he is going. You stand up, you say salam, that now because Rasulullah sallallahu is coming. Sometimes, as you know, that there are beautiful chairs and members are placed. And they say nobody will sit over there because this is the place of what? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So what happens is that the belief is, that yes, Prophet ﷺ is not only in Medina, but he can go anywhere, wherever you mention him. So people come and say, Ya Rasul Salam Alaika, Ya Habib Salam Alaika, as if they are talking to somebody who is in front of them. Or sometimes the people say, now, you know, stand up, sit down, because to show other. Unfortunately, this is sometimes taken to the utmost limits. So this is exactly what happened. That now come is, God is coming, Hadrat al Rabb is coming, the Sakina is coming, Shakina is coming. So by the time it reached to first century before Jesus, peace be upon him, it became like as if he is a God who is a person who comes down and comes up, and you can basically what? Have the interaction. And this is what led the, in, the sense of incarnation, that God incarnated into a human being. That's where the concept of Jesus being the incarnation of God not the full God, you know, it was in the beginning that the word of God incarnated into Jesus and came in the shape of a human being. I mean, Jesus was never accepted as full God in the beginning, you know, first century, second century, especially among the Jewish Christians. It was the word of God, it was the spirit of God, you know, which came. So spirit was personified, the word was personified. So whatever took place among the Christians was not out of a vacuum. It had in the background this whole concept of God coming down in the shape of a human being, in the shape of what? Hadra, Shakhina. So this is what is the basis. That's where I take it from here to the Christian chapter that you have got some of the backgrounds within the Jewish community of first and second century. I also want to make an other point and that point is that sometimes when you talk to the modern Jewish brothers and sisters, many of them have very different interpretations of these biblical passages or the way some people look at God. Sometimes they will say, oh, because Hebrew language is a very concrete language. You have to have some of those kind of you know, words which will look physical because human beings are living in primitive times and they cannot understand these modified, these revolutionized, philosophical, abstract terms. So to make the concept of God understandable to the uneducated Hebrews, God used these kind of physical terminologies, I am coming, I am sitting, I am weeping, I am crying, I am hungry, give me such and such. But Originally, they did not mean something physical. It meant only that basically God is trying to communicate a message. For instance, and I will give you some example, you know, that on the day of judgment, as we are told, on the day of judgment, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will say, I was hungry and you did not feed me. You know the famous hadith. 
or I was thirsty, you did not. And the person will say, no, I did not. You know, you are the Lord of the universe. How could you be thirsty or hungry? But the God, God will come and say, oh, because such and such person was sick, you did not visit. Such and such person was hungry, you did not, you know, feed him. Thirsty, you did not, uh, you know, quench his thirst. Had you done it, you would have found it with me. You understand my point? But the metaphorical sense over here is very clear. Number one, it is happening on the day of judgment. It's not God saying, I am hungry, give me the food. You know, I'm thirsty, give me the food right now. Number two, God is not saying that, now the explanation comes that my servant was sick or my servant was, the poor person was hungry or thirsty. If you would have fetched him or fed him, you would found the regard, reward with me today. He did not say you would have found that food with me or I would eat something. You understand my point? So when something comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, something comes from God, the demarcation line is very clear. Here the problem comes that human beings when they are trying to explain God or things of God or the values of God, somehow they have what? Uh, you know, diminished that demarcation line. So it does not look like a God, it looks like a human being. Sometimes they say that the concept of Islam is the transcendental other. God is somewhere in the heavens, he does not come down, he does not know what you are doing. How can he know something while sitting in the heavens, thousands of miles away from you? So basically the Jewish biblical understanding or Talmudic understanding to use these anthropomorphic terminologies is to make God imminent with you, that you feel his presence, he's eating with you, he is weeping with you, he shares your pains because he loves you. So this is the expression of his love. All of us we know you do not have to make God cry and weep and suffer just to make his presence closer to us. I mean, in Islamic terminology, we feel he's closer to us than our regular way. We don't see he's sitting with us or he's just doing such and such with us or he's crying and eating. You don't have to do it because by means of knowledge, by means of power, by means of authority, he could be with you. And also when we do something wrong, we know he's not happy with us. You know, the Quran mentioned that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not like the people who lie, does not like the people who cheat, does not like the people who kill, does not like, he does not, in Allah you have you know, muhsineen, he loves the muhsineen, but he hates what he hates, in Allah, la yuhibbu kafirin, la yuhibbu zalimin, la yuhibbu, he does not like, it does not mean that he is crying over you, he is, this is the same thing which has led to what is the Christian theology or understanding of Jesus, you know that God loved the world so much that he came by himself and number two he died for our sins to show his love. Now you understand what is the background? I mean the Christianity or Christian theology did not come in a vacuum. It has got something in the background and the background is what is the Jewish understanding or I would say the Hebrew understanding of God and how to express his love. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the source of balance in religiosity. Human beings, our knowledge is limited, so whenever we do something, we either go to this extreme or we go to the other extreme. Sometimes we are losing the balance. This issue of you know, superstitions and khurafat and belief in different gods, different powers have been from the beginning of humanity. And this is what the prophets came to stop that or to bring it back to the original road. If you look at the time of Nuh the worship of forefathers is what the Quran tells us. So these were the established people, maybe scholars, maybe kings, maybe leaders when they died. Oh, because they were powerful in this dunya, so they are powerful in the life to come. So they put the mazar for them, they started worshipping them, seeking their assistance as they were seeking their help in this world. Also, this is not a trend at the time of Nuh this is happening even nowadays. A scholar dies, somebody is known, you make a mazar out of them. So people are going all over the world 
to seek assistance you can say sheikh al badawi you know you can call it so many such and such kufri sheikh you know just name it in pakistan masha allah the utmost the best business is the business of those bazaar everybody goes puts the money because the folklore the poor iman the weak iman wants to get things done by means of what something this is the sense of insecurity the sense of insecurity leads to some immediate solution we want to have the patches and that bandage work leads to this kind of superstitions so islam allah subhanahu wa taala has always sent the prophets to correct that road to bring them back to that sense of iman security all of that